Thank you very much. Um, so thank you, first of all, for inviting me. Um, I'm honored to be here. And I've actually, I've only had a chance to listen this morning a little bit to the conference, but I've been very impressed by the conference. Um, so thanks for that. But I am here to talk about something um, that I'm not so impressed with and, and that I think that none of us should really be happy with. And that's the situation in communicating science in general, I think. But what I'm going to be concentrating on is communication in, um, in situations where an infectious disease is spreading. Um, now, the reason I'm doing that is that a lot of my work as a science journalist has been um, in, spread, in, sorry, in covering infectious diseases. Um, and that's also the reason that um, I think it's also one of the situations where you can see particularly well when communication breaks down. Um, now, enduring uncertainty is the name of the title. I hope it'll become clear um, during the talk why, why uncertainty is so important in this. But first of all, um, what's the problem? Why am I so convinced that there's a problem in the first case? Now, I've been a science journalist for not that long, actually, for about six years. Um, and during that time, I've covered a lot of infectious diseases because there are a lot of infectious diseases. So I've written about malaria and HIV and other diseases, but also there have been outbreaks like EHEC in Germany. Um, there was H1N1, avian influenza. More recently, there was the Ebola outbreak in West Africa, which is still going on. Um, people tend to forget that. That's another thing we should talk about. Um, and the MERS outbreak here in Korea, which is also technically still going on. Um, I know that your government recently basically announced that the MERS outbreak is over, but um, the WHO has a slightly different view on this, basically because as long as there is someone who's harboring the virus and there's still one patient who hasn't cleared the virus, the outbreak isn't over. Actually, the moment that he clears the virus, you have to wait for two incubation periods, which will be 42 days, I think. Uh, until you can actually declare the, the outbreak over. Um, now, you could just trust me when I tell you, you know, from covering this for six years, there is a problem with communication. But of course, uh, in journalism, we have, you know, a golden rule, which is show, don't tell. Um, and I will, I will try to show you in the talk. Um, so a lot of you will probably have seen this picture. Um, I, I happened to actually be in, um, in, in Seoul at the time, so this was uh, in June. I was at a conference, the World Conference of Science Journalists, uh, when the MERS outbreak was at its height. Um, this picture went around um, on, on social media, and it also was printed in a lot of newspapers. Now, there's two interesting things about this. Now, first of all, this picture was done as a bit of a joke. Now, it, it's not that everybody at this wedding was actually really afraid that they were going to catch MERS. It was a bit of a, you know, a nice photo op. Um, now, first of all, it was printed in a lot of newspapers around the world, you know, to illustrate how dangerous the situation has gotten and how, how afraid people in South Korea were, which is one side of the equation um, where, where communication apparently didn't work so well. And the other part is the fact that, you know, a lot of people, when I was in Seoul, a lot of people were wearing face masks. Now, I know face masks, you know, a lot of people wear them anyway in a lot of Asian um, big cities. but. Um, I talked to a lot of people, and it was a lot more people than usual. Um, and at the same time, the, you know, as far as we know, face masks don't, <laughs> don't really do anything against MERS. Now, if you're, if you're a doctor, you have to wear what is called an N95 respirator, which is a certain uh, type of very close fitting. It's not really a face mask. It's, it's a lot more than that. So um, you, know, you can ask, why, why was everybody wearing face masks? Why, why didn't somebody step in and say, you know, this is actually pointless? The other thing is, um, this was also a picture um, that, that went round. Um, it was printed by a lot of newspapers. Now, this is one of the subway trains in Seoul being disinfected. Uh, MERS spread in hospitals, um, in clinics. There's no reason to think that it would spread in the subway. Um, and yet, you know, these kinds of images clearly showed that people were afraid that this was happening and people were actually addressing it. So, um, you know, I think we have to remember that actions also are communication. When you do something like this, you know, it's, it's a little bit like, you know, I mean, you can't tell somebody, oh, you know, it's totally fine. Go in the subway. There's nothing to worry about. And then you start spraying it with disinfectant. I mean, anybody would say, you know what, it doesn't fit together. Um, this is uh, just one more instance where I think things went very wrong. <laughs> Um, so apparently you have, I've forgotten the number. It's, it's one of these things in my job is that you learn really weird facts like how many camels there are in South Korea. 
So I think there were 46 camels in South Korea at the time, 24 of them on a camel farm on Jeju. Uh, the rest of them uh, spread across a few zoos. Um, now, when the, when the MERS outbreak happened, uh, all of these camels were put in quarantine um, because people were afraid of camels. But clearly, we knew that this was a business traveler who just returned from a business trip to the Middle East, who had brought the disease here. There was no reason to suspect any involvement of the camels. So, again, you can ask yourself, you know, where, where did something go wrong? Why, why did this happen? Um, and actually, um, I think in the booklet there's an article um, that I wrote at the time. I didn't want to reproduce it here again, but um, I wrote something about the communication problems uh, in Korea, and I was surprised. Now, if you, I cover the WHO, the World Health Organization, quite a bit, um, and the WHO is not the kind of body that will go out and tell you, you know, oh, this country is doing something really wrong, because, you know, it's, um, they have a lot of member states, they need to keep everyone happy. So I was actually quite surprised at the time that the WHO, you know, quite forcefully said, you know, it's wrong to close the schools, there's no need to get, you know, we, we don't need to wear face masks, there's no reason uh, to quarantine camels. So basically the WHO at the time was criticizing Korea for the way that it was handling this. Now interestingly, the WHO itself didn't do so well in Ebola. Um, this is the Ebola interim assessment report. It came out on 7th of July. Um, it was set up specifically to look at um, how the WHO had handled everything around the Ebola uh, outbreak. The main reason for that is that um, the WHO, so I don't know how much you know about the Ebola outbreak, but it basically started in December 2013, as far as we know, when a, when a little boy in Guinea um, contracted Ebola. Um, and then it started spreading, and by the time that the WHO finally declared it a public health emergency of international concern, which was on 7th of August 2014, um, it had already grown to a huge epidemic, um, so they were criticized for that, and this assessment report was to look at that. But they looked at all aspects of how the WHO handled this, and interestingly, some of the most critical, um, some of the most critical comments are actually about communication. So they wrote, the panel is clear that WHO failed to engage proactively with high-level media and was unable to gain command over the narrative of the outbreak. And then, importantly, it says, this weakness had repercussions for many areas of the response. A better approach to a communications could have improved confidence in WHO and reduced levels of fear and panic. Which brings me to the second part of my talk. So, first of all, there is a problem, and the second question is, why is it important? Why do we care about this problem? Now, a lot of you will, will have seen this kind of picture, I guess. Um, it just shows you, you know, the, um, the network of flights uh, around the world. Um, it's just one of those pictures. It's, it's a bit of a cliche nowadays, but you know, we live in a globalized world. Um, I came here from Berlin uh, yesterday in seven hours, in ten hours or something. Um, and anybody can fly anywhere, and any infectious disease that crops up anywhere is likely to be able to crop up somewhere else as well. Um, that's important for two reasons, because first of all, um, it means that one infectious disease can spread, but it also means that those infectious diseases that we see somewhere, they, they might be able, um, in a different context, to, to lead to a very different outbreak, and I'll, I'll come back to that. Um, now, the other thing I just wanted, and maybe to explain this a little bit, um, this is a graph, it's actually quite old, this is, um, where is it, October. So by now, so this is, sorry, this is um, the years, 1976 was the year of the first Ebola outbreak, this was when Ebola was discovered. There were quite a few outbreaks around this time, um, but they were, as you can see, this is the number of uh, deaths and this is the number of infected that survived. Um, as you can see, it is completely dwarfed by this, and by now this would have to go up to, I think, to 20,000, I haven't even, or at least 12,000, I have to check. Um, so, what this, why I'm showing this, uh, what this is supposed to tell you is just one very simple fact. You have, you know, you have one, one virus, and it can lead to these small outbreaks, and all of a sudden you can have something like this. So what is the difference? I mean, I studied molecular biomedicine, like most people I have a paradigm that I look at the world through, and I think every scientist, the first thought is, okay, maybe the virus changed. Um, and people check that, and the virus is the same that it always was. So what is different between these outbreaks, which happened here um, in Central Africa, and this huge outbreak? And the main difference is, it's a different population. People are more mobile, people trust the government less, um, the burial practices are different, so there's the danger of, uh, of actually infecting people um, through funerals. 
And that's one example, and the other one um, is MERS. If you look at this, this is a graph, uh, the ECDC, the European Centers for Disease Control, um, they, they are very helpful in these kinds of things. They have great graphs, and, they, and this shows you, um, so there's been lots and lots of cases in Saudi Arabia, but actually MERS has been exported to a lot of places. If you look at this, it's been exported three times to Germany, two times to the Netherlands. It's been in the United Kingdom. I think this is actually, it was exported two times, and then two of these were, were, were infections where, where somebody else was infected within the country. Uh, Italy once, Greece twice. I mean, there's lots and lots of places and never was there, you know, a big outbreak. And then all of a sudden um, it goes to South Korea and you have a big outbreak. Why do you have a big outbreak? Again, the population is different. Uh, the healthcare system works differently here. You have people who go to one hospital and then they go to the next and the next and the next. You have uh, families staying with, with patients for a long time. I mean, all of these are things that I didn't know about before, but um, when people look at why you, know, why you have this kind of outbreak, they start looking at these cultural practices and often they find very good reasons uh, why things are different. Um, so that tells you that when a certain pathogen comes to a new country, it could lead to a much bigger outbreak or a much smaller outbreak depending on, on the cultural situation there. Anyway, let's talk about trust. So um, I hope um, you agree with me that it is a problem and that it is important. And one of the questions is um, what goes wrong in these situations? I think one of the biggest problems we have is a problem of trust. Um, again, this is something I'm talking a lot about Ebola and MERS because those are you know, the, two, the two instances that are very, um, very recent um, and that I know the most about. And in both of these cases, trust was hugely important, or rather distrust. So in the case of Ebola, um, for very good reasons, um, the, the population in Guinea and in Sierra Leone and in Liberia is very critical of the government. And there were a lot of theories going around that this was actually, you know, um, that, this had, that it was all a lie or that it had been spread by the government. And all of these things really made it very hard for people like Doctors Without Borders um, to go into these, into these places and try to, um, and try to contain the virus. Um, the other thing, um, the other situation where you can see this is in Korea as well. I was surprised, and I mean, a lot of you um, will know this better than I do, um, and I don't speak Korean. I've only spoken to a few Koreans um, who speak English and who, who told me when I asked them about uh, the MERS outbreak and why people were overreacting so much, um, every single person that I talked to mentioned the Sewol ferry disaster. And they said, well, you know, we're very distrustful of our government right now because there were apparently, I don't know the specifics of Sewol, but there were apparently a lot of people felt that the government had completely mishandled that. And that was one reason why they didn't feel they could trust the government now um, on this. So trust is hugely important. What does it mean for the different stakeholders? For journalists, it means, um, you know, don't hype and down, don't downplay. Um, one of the problems, at least that we in Germany have, and I think it's a similar problem around the world, is that a lot of people don't actually trust the newspapers that much anymore. They feel that every day, you know, somebody else is saying something, you know, something is really dangerous or something is going to kill everyone. And they, they feel, you know, it's all, it's all hype. So they don't really trust it. On the other hand, there's other people who feel, you know, that we're not really tackling the right issues. Uh, we're downplaying the ones that are really important. So I think this is, it is hugely important. Sometimes it's so much easier in the short run, you know, to have a nice, a uh, nice headline saying something really crass, but of course in the long run you erode trust and when people don't trust the newspapers anymore then we, I think we have a problem. Of course we live you know, in the 21st century, there's blogs um, and lots of other um, outlets, but that makes it even more difficult I think. Now for experts, what does it mean? Gaining trust means you have to be available. Now, the first thing if you want to gain trust is to actually be there and talk about the situation and actually allow people, you know, give people a chance to trust you. Um, the other thing is, you know, don't hold back, be candid. That's really important. You have to, you know, be honest about the problems you're facing and you have to be honest about, you know, what you think the problems are. You should probably be honest telling people that a face mask won't really help because a face mask, you know, is ridiculous in that situation. Well, you know, somebody, somebody has to go out and, and look at the evidence base at least and tell people about it. Now, prior relationship of course is, is crucial in this. So when I, sometimes I'm invited to talk with, um, with people uh, like the German version of the CDC to talk to them about how to communicate with the public in, in these kind of situations. And I always say, you know, 
once you have an outbreak, it's too late to build trust. You won't be able to build trust in that kind of, you know, very difficult situation. And also, you know, you have huge time constraints. I mean, everybody in these situations, everybody is working, you know, 24 seven. So it's hugely important that you know beforehand who these people are, who the people, so people, experts, people in government, people in the, in the institutes, they should know their, their counterparts in the newspapers and they should know who they, who they need to talk to. So this kind of prior relationship I think is crucial. Um, and just a really quick detour, I think what a lot of people don't realize about newspapers and media is that, you know, it, like any other place, there's lots of different people with you know, very different opinions on things. Now, in a typical newspaper, the science journalist, that would be me at my newspaper, is, you know, a little bit of a nerd. Like, at science, it's a little bit different, we're all nerds. But, but at a newspaper, um, you know, you have the sports journalist, who's the cool jock and whatever, and you have the, the political journalist, who's, you know, the, the important person, because he writes, because he knows the politicians personally. And then you have the science journalist, who's kind of, you know, the guy who writes about really weird things, but sometimes it's funny or a little bit scary, and that's why it's okay. Um, I think you have to realize that that kind of dynamic does go on in a newspaper and the moment you have an outbreak that dynamic can lead to the science journalist being sidelined. We've seen that again and again in a lot of situations. So one reason why prior relationship is so important is because you need to be able to know who to talk to at the newspaper at this kind of point in time to be sure that you know, there's somebody who actually understands you and it's not a political you know, journalist who's been told oh we need to you know we need to write about this and has no prior knowledge. I think that's, that's another thing that you need to talk about. Now let's look at the MERS outbreak just for a second and talk a little bit about what maybe went wrong. Um, now clearly a lot has been talked about the fact that the hospitals weren't disclosed in the beginning. I mean this goes back to the issue of trust um, and transparency is hugely important. There were, I think there were social networks where certain lists of hospitals were, um, were circulating. Uh, the government didn't want to, for whatever reason, um, didn't want to disclose these names in the beginning. Of course, in the end, they were forced to do it anyway. Um, and that is the worst kind of transparency. It's the one where people feel, okay, you're only telling them the bit they, that you, know, you really need to tell them now because everybody's so angry for not telling them, but they, by that time, you've lost all trust because you had to force them to tell you the truth. So um, if I had had to advise anyone, I would have said, you know, give out those lists. I mean, the honest truth is a lot of people, when I was in, in Seoul in June, a lot of people asked me, aren't you scared of MERS? I said, why should I be scared of MERS? I mean, you know, I'm walking along the street, there's, there's no reason to think that, I, that, you know, I would be able to contract MERS. I would be scared a little bit if I had to go to a hospital. I would have thought a little bit about whether I really want to go to a hospital in Seoul while this infection is spreading, because it was spreading in hospitals. So clearly there is a very good argument to be made for people to know what hospitals actually had MERS cases and for them to avoid them if they want to. I think, you know, if you, if you think that's a wrong decision, you, make, you need to make a good case why it is, and nobody did that. So not disclosing the hospitals, I think, was one of the first mistakes, and it probably led to, to a very difficult situation from the beginning. Um, another thing that happened that to me is still incredible is the fact that the, the Korean CDC has a Twitter account, um, and they, they would give out news there, but they were also getting a lot of, well, abuse sometimes, I guess, from, from other users who, who were, you know, arguing with them, saying, you know, you're not doing enough or whatever. And their reaction was to, to close the, 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 the Twitter account. Um, or when I say close, I don't mean they deleted it. They just closed it for, for people who are, um, who are not signed up. So then you had to sign up. Again, this creates the impression that you're keeping things from people, that you don't want people to know what's actually going on. Um, very, very bad decision in that kind of situation, I think. Um, this is another thing, this is a little bit more complicated, giving numbers without context. Now, what was happening in the MERS outbreak uh, most of the time was um, people, I think the Korean government felt it was being very transparent in the sense that every day they had new numbers on their website, which is true. Um, it's a lot more than was happening, for instance, in, in Saudi Arabia. Uh, it's still very difficult to get you know, decent numbers from Saudi Arabia, so clearly Korea was doing a lot better. But at the same time, it was creating the impression that you know, there's this outbreak and it's just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And what was missing was you know, contextualizing information. Information about, the, I mean, the basic message that this is happening in hospitals. You don't need to worry if you're you know, out on the street or going to the supermarket or you know, on a subway train. Um, what do we actually now know about MERS? 
anything that would put these numbers into context and would help to, to deal better with them instead of just giving the numbers. This I talked about a little bit with the pictures, giving mixed signals. Um, I think it's one of the biggest problems in communicating uh, outbreaks anywhere. It's what always happens. People say, you know, you don't really have to worry about that. But to be 100% sure, we're going to do this anyway. Well, that means that you aren't really sure that, you know, not doing it would be safe. So, you know, you need, to, you need to decide which it is. Is it okay to be on a subway train? Or do we need to, you know, disinfect them? Maybe I don't want to ride on a subway then. I don't know. Um, now, this is my, my, my personal problem, I think. But, um, <laughs> but, but um, you know, again, when we talk about a globalized world, I mean, MERS made headlines around the world. Um, I talked to someone at the, at the Ministry of Health because I said, you know, you're giving all this information only in Korean. Um, there's Google Translate, which I used. It's okay for the numbers. But, I mean, you're, you're creating all kinds of problems about the information that is going out there. If you want to be in charge of the information, for God's sake, pay a translator who will, you know, it's, it's a few sentences a day. You'll be able to pay for that, I think. Um, and give the information at least in English. Um, I think that's hugely important. There were a lot of people, I was getting people on Twitter because people were seeing that I was writing about it. I was getting a lot of people who were planning trips to Korea, being anxious, asking me whether it was safe to go there or whether it was okay for, for their son to start studying in Korea and so on. I mean, for all of these reasons nowadays, it's hugely important to, you know, to, to think outside uh, your own country as well. Um, let me check how much time I have. Okay, um, there's one particular example I want to talk a little bit about, um, and that's models. Um, now, the reason I want to talk about models is threefold. One is because it crops up again and again when we're talking about um, when we're talking about infectious diseases. Uh, the second is it really bothered me when I was writing about Ebola. Um, it was really difficult for me to know how to deal with these models. And the third one is. Um, I think it illustrates very well what, what I mean when I talk about uncertainty. And when I talk about models, um, I mean this kind of thing. Now, this is one of the first stories I wrote about Ebola. Uh, as you can see, this was in July, so this was before it was declared an outbreak, uh, before it was declared a public health emergency of international concern by the WHO. And it was at about 900 cases. And I wrote the story about a lot of scientists around the world who were creating these kinds of models saying, okay, if, you know, if the outbreak continues, how many, how many cases do we have to expect? And as you can see here, um, now the, the best estimate is the blue one that gives you about 10,000 cases um, by September 24th. This is one of the early models. Um, this is a very, very famous model um, that came out a little bit later. Um, this is the model that was quoted everywhere, which said the worst case scenario is 1.4 million people will have been infected by, <clears throat> by the end of January 2015. Um, the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, the US CDC, um, did this, and it's a modeling exercise, um, and that's the problem. So what they said was the worst case scenario up to 1.4 million people. This is, um, by the way, only Sierra Leone and Liberia. Guinea isn't even in there because Guinea was very hard to model because it was going up and down. Almost impossible to, to, to try and get a model out of that. Um, now, what the model also says, a model right, gives you different scenarios. Um, um, it also said if control efforts are stepped up in a truly dramatic fashion and prove a stunning success, the epidemic could be almost over by that time. So basically what the model is telling you is, you know, there could be anything between zero and 1.4 million cases by, by January. I think um, <laughs> these models bring out the worst in us journalists because, you know, if you can choose between saying, it, you know, the outbreak might be over by January and saying there might be 1.4 million people who are infected with Ebola, I'm pretty sure every journalist I know is going to choose the 1.4 million. Um, well, or at least a high number. Uh, and that's the other problem. Um, it completely, it lets you completely forget the individual behind these numbers. I mean, it becomes just a number. So just to illustrate that point, this is the New York Times, which went with the 1.4 million cases uh, as a headline. This is the Washington Post, which also went with the 1.4 million. This is uh, National Geographic, which said it could top a million because, you know, what's 400,000 people? Um, this is the CNN, which went with 550,000, which was a, you know, a moderate estimate in there. So 
it becomes a little bit, you know, oh, it's half a million, a million people, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe a million people will die, maybe half a million. It's like 500,000 people, doesn't matter. Um, and this, I think, was the low point of that particular, um, of that, that particular story in Ebola um, was when there was a story about actually five million people could die from the outbreak. Um, and I tried to trace where those five million came from because those five million aren't in the CDC report. Um, and interestingly, this is Deutsche Welle. This is a German um, television that basically broadcasts news uh, around the world, uh, but is paid for by the German government. Um, and they had a story about Sierra Leone and Liberia more or less being ravaged by Ebola. Now, the interesting thing is if you look the article up today, it says uh, it could more or less infect everybody and many people could die. But they've actually changed this. There is, if you look at the archive, you can find an old version on this. That's the thing about the internet. You always find an old version. Um, so you can actually see that a German uh, virologist, Schmidt Hanasset, uh, basically said it would infect more or less everybody in these uh, countries and half the population, which is five million people, could die. Um, just, I think whoever wrote this article, I've forgotten the name, um, but I think they didn't even think about the implications of this. Um, again, we live in a globalized world and of course this kind of news gets picked up by people who live in the country. So a few days later you had an article in the Daily Observer, which is a newspaper in Monrovia in Liberia, where basically people in Liberia could read that half the people in their country were going to die, which uh, you know, a respected virologist in Germany was saying. So if you think about that for a moment and, and, you know, and how, we, how we kind of treat people, um, I think it's quite shocking. Um, just, you know, I'm a journalist. Um, journalists aren't all bad. Uh, Norimitsu Onishi, who's one of the best journalists, in my opinion, um, uh, on this uh, in, in Ebola, um, he wrote a very, very, very good story. Uh, and it won the Pulitzer Prize for a reason. Um, and he really tried to break it down. He tried to explain, um, you know, in one family how this disease spreads, why it's so difficult to stop, why it is so heartbreaking for, for Liberians to be faced with it, what makes it so much worse for a lot of them than even the Civil War was. Um, so instead of going to these high numbers, which is very easy, you can shock people by saying there'll be millions of dead people. This took a lot of work and it really dug down into the issues and it, in the end, it, you know, it, it showed the problem so much better and it made you empathize um, and, you know, and realize a little bit more about what the problem was. Another story, this is Nature, our competitor, but you know, they're good. Um, this is Ebola's Lost Ward, um, a story by Erica Check Hayden, who also wrote a lot of very good stories about Ebola, um, looking at one hospital that, that had been ravaged. Again, going down, you know, looking at one issue, trying, trying to explain this in the microcosm and not just go, go with the huge numbers. There were also lots of examples of really bad articles. Um, or newspaper coverage. This is another low point in Ebola coverage. The CNN headline, you know, Ebola, is it the ISIS of biological agents? I'm, you know, to this day, I'm not sure what that comparison is you know, supposed to mean. But anyway, um, I got so frustrated with uh, you know, the inability to talk about Ebola um, in a decent way that I actually wrote an article uh, that looks at, at how we should talk about this. This came out of a conversation that I had with Peter Sandman, a risk communication expert in New York. Um, and I had a lot of phone conversations with him and was writing back and forth emails. Um, so at some point I said, you know, maybe we should just write this down. And I think he made a lot of very good points that, um, that I just want to highlight because I think they're important for all of us. Uh, you know, this is important at the time. This was important for me because I was thinking about how do I deal with something like this model. But I think this applies in general. Now, one of the points he made in one of his emails was, you need to teach the world how exponential growth works. Again, this is contextual you know, information. Um, and he was saying, explain that you know, this worst case estimate of 1.4 million by the end of January is the same as 700,000 by mid-January, because at that point, Ebola cases were doubling every two or three weeks. Um, and this was just taking exponential growth. Um, and I think 1.4 million, you know, without this context is very different from, you know, this is the same as saying, you know, 10,000 cases, whatever, three months earlier or something. Um, another point he made, and this is where I'm taking the title of my um, talk from, he said, teach the world to endure uncertainty. Um, I think, again, this is something that people shy away from. He said the Ebola virus might mutate in ways that would make it even more dangerous than it is now. This is you know, one of, one of the scenarios that people were talking about. Uh, at the other extreme, Ebola might somehow burn itself out or it might become endemic 
in Africa without spreading widely elsewhere in the world. And then, more important than any individual scenario is the reality that we know so little about which scenarios are likely and which are vanishingly unlikely or even impossible. Until now, our knowledge of Ebola comes almost entirely from small outbreaks in African villages. So the number one point that I want to bring across today is that we know very little, but we still need to talk about it. I think a lot of experts and a lot of other people feel that when we know very little about something, you know, we should just, you know, it, it would be better just to not talk about it because clearly we know so little anyway. But people are going to, you know, have questions and, you know, and have scenarios and you need to address that. And you need to talk about the different scenarios and you need to, you know, make people also realize that you're looking at these scenarios. But you can't judge necessarily which scenarios are, um, are the most likely to actually happen. Um, so after I'd written this and talked to him a lot, I actually tried to do this in writing one article where I was just giving scenarios, just talking about, so what are the different options? That is one view that you can, you know, one, one possibility of tackling something like this. It's just giving these different possibilities, always saying it is just a possibility. People will pick their favorite scenario, people will be completely convinced, you know, which one of these will come true. But I think, you know, you have to be open and transparent and just be honest that these are scenarios. Um, this is another point, I'll, I'll fly across this. Um, just to talk about fear for a second. Um, the reason that all of the problems in communicating science become so clear when you talk about communicating, you know, about infectious diseases, is that it's, it's a subject that is so, um, so fraught with fear in the minds of people, um, understandably. And so I went to Liberia in November, um, which was, you know, by far not the worst time to be there. Um, we had the highest case numbers in August. Um, but even when I went in November, clearly I was a little bit scared about going there. Um, the interesting thing is, once I landed and once I was in the country and once I was talking to people and I was seeing people, it became a very normal um, thing. The, you know, the fear, actually the moment I landed, more or less, the fear was gone. You arrive there and you think it must be this, you know, total nightmare scenario with nothing working and then you arrive and you know the world is just going on it's you know it, people are living their lives um, yes there are people dying but you know there's always people dying of diseases um, there were you know it was a scary disease in a lot of ways no question about it um, but it's not like you couldn't go there as a journalist to cover it and I think one of the problems in covering Ebola um, in the way that it came across in a lot of Western media was that a lot of people were too afraid to go there so, for instance, in Germany, public television actually, you know, didn't allow its journalists to go there because they felt they couldn't um, ensure their safety. Of course, in the way that you write about an outbreak that people tell you is too dangerous for you to go there yourself, it's going to be in a certain way. I mean, it, it's just going to color your perspective on this. Um, and I think it led to the media emphasizing very strongly how dangerous Ebola was, how difficult it was to you know, do anything, and also always emphasizing that there was no known cure for it. Um, that fed back into the epidemic in a very negative way. I mean, one of the biggest problems in the beginning was that the public message saying, you know, um, we can't do anything for you, but please come to the ETU so we can you know, take you away from your family and you can you know, die a horrible death um, without anyone around you, wasn't one you know, that any one of us would find particularly comforting um, or would make us want to go to an ETU. So one of the reasons that people didn't go to, to these Ebola treatment units in the beginning was simply that you know, it wasn't a very you know, positive proposition that was being made to them, and partly that was because because of this emphasis on, um, on Ebola not being, um, you know, there being no cure. Of course, the reality was, if you went to an ETU, you had a better chance of surviving it because you could get fluid replacement. I mean, even that you couldn't always get, but the reality is you were better off. Also, of course, you know, it was better for your family members if you were in an ETU because you were less likely uh, to infect them. The point is, fear colors our perspective. Um, and I think when we, I think it's one of those reasons why communicating about infectious diseases, um, why trust and transparency are so important. Because as soon as you, as you get this, this fear effect, it'll get very, very difficult for you to, you know, to get people to trust you again or you know, to, do, to do rational things. Um, 
Okay, I'm going to wrap up my talk. Um, just one more model I wanted to talk about for a second. I think there will be a talk about this tomorrow, actually. Um, but one of the problems in all of this is, is the deficit model. Now, the deficit model, I don't know whether every, everyone here knows this. Um, it's, you know, it's been criticized a lot, but um, it's basically the assumption that scientists you know, have knowledge that they can give to the public. And once the public has that knowledge, it will understand and agree with the scientist about what he, what he has to do. Um, it's a very, very simple model of how communication works. It's a one directional model. Um, it means information is being transferred only in one direction. And I think it's completely wrong and it's in the 21st century, it's, it's uh, not applicable at all. But a lot of media still operate on this assumption and a lot of scientists operate on this assumption and a lot of uh, governments operate on this assumption. So one of the things that you need to do in epidemic as well is to give the public a chance to ask questions, to you know, give their opinions. Um, and just to have this kind of feedback situation where you, you know, you're not just putting something out there, you're actually listening as well. Um, and I think we'll hear more about that tomorrow. Um, there are some other models that I think are a lot better adapted to, to the modern, modern media landscape and, 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 and to the needs also of something like this. Um, but for the moment, thanks a lot for listening. Um, if you have questions, uh, you can ask them now. You can also email me or write on Twitter. Uh, I don't know how many of you use Twitter, but you should. Um, we need more scientists on Twitter. Yeah, and with that, I'm happy to take questions. <laughs>